It's a story that's borrowed from from the Middle Ages. You know, you poison him, you shoot him, you stab him, but he he's, he jumps up. This is the beast that will not die. The corpse in the river was Gregory Rasputin. Holy man, political fixer, sex addict, mystic. If you were with him, you thought he was a great seer. But if you were against him, he was the most sexually depraved monster in history. This is the story of the rise and fall of one of the most charismatic and controversial figures in the 20th century. In life, he divided the nation, and in death, he tore it apart. You've got to get rid of this man because he represents a tremendous threat uh, to the survival of the regime. It's a very dark and frightening time in which people really do feel that the world that they've known is about to slip away. There's going to be a revolution. The monarchy's going to collapse. Who was this extraordinary man? How did he become the most powerful and most hated man in Russia? Who really killed him? And why? In December 1915, Alexei, beloved son of the Tsar and Tsarina, was fighting for his life. The Tsarina had waited 10 years for a son and heir, and Alexei was the answer to all her prayers. But he was gravely ill. He was a haemophiliac, and he was hemorrhaging blood. As he neared death, his terrified mother called the only person she trusted to treat him. Gregory Rasputin. Rasputin, of all the people who come and gone, and other prophets and seers and quacks and phony healers that offered their pennyworth advice over the years, but Rasputin was the only one who had really been able to effectively help Alexei. I think of him as a sort of people whisperer, human whisperer. When Rasputin came into the room, when he prayed and spoke with this extraordinarily sonorous, calming voice, it had some kind of tranquilizing effect on him. But more importantly, Rasputin was able to kind of calm and soothe the Tsaritsa. And as she calms, the boy was reassured The next day, the child was well again. It was a miracle. And of course, that confirmed to her that this was some kind of figure sent from God, almost. So she clung to him so stubbornly, so passionately, and she would not hear a word said against him. The boy's illness was a state secret. The future of the Romanovs depended on the healing power and discretion of one man, Rasputin. But Rasputin was from a very different world. Born in 1869 in a tiny village in Siberia, his childhood was marked by poverty and isolation. Married in his teens, he had three children in quick succession. But at the age of 28, after serving time for rape and horse theft, Rasputin was banished and set out alone for his new life as a wandering mystic. He was a pilgrim for, for many, many years, wandering barefoot through the cold, through the snow, through the rain, from, from monastery to monastery, church to church, in, in search of God and in, in search of meaning. I think he was shaped by Siberia in his independence. Siberia is very unlike the rest of Russia. There were no serfs there. There was no tradition of subservience. He was obviously no kind of priest. He was no kind of monk, as people sometimes call him. Um, he was entirely self-proclaimed holy man. What was it that, that made him special? 
I think on one hand it was his true, true gifts that he definitely had. Even his enemies admitted that there was a certain power, a certain energy, sort of penetration through the eyes and everything that able to look into people's souls. And I think there was also a good deal of ambition on his part. And I think this drove him to Petrograd. After eight years of wandering, Rasputin arrived in Petrograd, where the city was a hotbed of sex, sin, and revolution. It was full of bored, rich ladies in search of spiritual enlightenment, exactly what this ambitious holy man from Siberia was offering. It was very fashionable amongst aristocratic society in those days to patronize these kind of mystics and healers because um, there was a terrible ennui infecting the Russian aristocracy. They were always searching for something more, more beyond their normal everyday lives. It's a way for the elite to have contact with, with peasant Russia. And it, there's, there's a certain hunger there. There's a sense of immediacy of that this is the real Russia that they're touching. Rasputin soon became a celebrity with a horde of aristocratic groupies, including Russia's first lady. On the 1st of November, 1905, he was summoned to a meeting with the Tsarina. She was instantly captivated. Rasputin's function for her and for Nicholas too was as a wise counsel. He was like a personal guru. Nicholas once said, he is the Russian soul. So through him, they thought they were having a contact with the 120 million plus musics, the Russian peasants. Rasputin, who was a good reader of character, didn't take long to spot the truth about Tsar Nicholas. He was weak, he was physically brave, but uh, morally utterly weak. He resented anyone who was cleverer than him. There's this, this story that Nicholas uh, II was like a pillow. In other words, he, he bore the impression of whoever was the last one to sit on him. Rasputin realized that the real power lay elsewhere with the Tsarina. And he saw something in her that he recognized in himself. They were both outsiders at court. She was a German-English princess he was a Siberian peasant. She was very isolated at court, very alienated because most people at court actually disliked her. In fact, even her own relatives loathed her. She herself was awkward in that society and felt herself very disliked and, and, and unhappy in that society. It made her personally want all the more to feel that she was in communion with uh, the greater, the real Russia outside that world. Rasputin's visits to the palace became more and more frequent. He had access that no one else enjoyed. I think Rasputin's relationship with the Tsarina is, is probably key to this whole story. The Tsarina was besotted with Rasputin and his spiritual power, but there was another much darker side to him, as she was about to discover. By 1916, Russia had been at war for two and a half years, two and a half years of grinding, catastrophic losses. There is this great deadening weight of, of fatalism of Russia just going on the path to destruction. The country was being torn apart by war. Millions were dying at the front and many were starving in the cities. You've got a people worn down by shortages, by hunger, by cold, by deprivation, while the aristocracies are out clubbing and whining and dining and still drinking champagne and eating caviar. By now, Petrograd was increasingly dangerous, especially for the rich and famous. 
The Tsarina had insisted Nicholas put a watch on Rasputin to keep him safe. But what the secret police discovered came as something of a surprise. At 10.15 in the morning, Rasputin was followed to number 8 Pushkinskaya Street to the prostitute Tregobova and thence to the baths. He paid scant attention to my petition, but plucked my face, then my breasts, mumbling all the time, kiss me, I have taken a fancy to you. Month after month, Rasputin was observed with women or leaving to get drunk at all hours. This saintly holy man was leading a double life. He loved parties, he loved drinking, he loved womanizing. But particularly, he liked indulging himself in, in sex and in food and in large quantities of drink. He had a rather sick habit of, of liking to paw women the first time he met them, rubbing his hands up and down their backs and over their chest and that sort of thing. Well, he was up to having a good time, basically, by 1916. And of course, he'd been tremendously spoiled by then. He was a deeply instinctual person. I think he was somebody, if he felt something, he acted on it. And that often got him, you know, in bed with women or got him drunk. And it wasn't just prostitutes. Rasputin also had his pick of rich women who fell under the spell of his mesmerizing gaze. He did almost certainly have sex with, with high society ladies on a serial basis. So, yes, I think there was a sort of compulsive sexual drive. He would certainly have accepted sexual favours from women and from wives and relatives of people who wanted promotions in the army. Rasputin certainly, uh, let's say, exploited his, his position in society without a shadow of a doubt. If the secret police reports had remained a secret, there may not have been a problem. But they didn't. By 1915, Petrograd was awash with seditious papers and scandal sheets, all with one aim, to discredit the Romanov family and loosen its grip on power. And these papers were soon full of the contents of the police reports. Rasputin sold newspapers, gossip sells newspapers, and they would follow his every move. So literally, there'd be a notice, you know, in the newspapers, Rasputin left today on the number five train back to Siberia. What is he up to? When will he return? The stories became more and more lurid, extreme, and politically damaging. Supposedly at a restaurant in Moscow called the Yar, Rasputin got up, pulled his pants down and waved his member saying, you know, this is the tool that rules Russia and before which the Empress bows down, etc., etc. It's very clear that this was a manufactured scandal. Ultimately, the stories served a purpose, and the purpose was to tarnish the image of the, the ruling house and lead to revolution, ultimately. It was widely known that Rasputin did mix sex and religion. He was driven by this belief that the path to redemption and self-improvement lay through sin, through committing sin and admitting to it and repenting and becoming a better person. But there was one story in particular that poisoned public opinion against Rasputin. And it wasn't just about sex. Rasputin was at one point accused of being a member of the Chlisti, a, a, a very extreme sect that, got, that were involved in sexual flagellation and all kinds of orgiastic behavior. Calling someone a Chlist in 1915 Russia would be like calling someone a communist in 1950 America. He wasn't actually a Chlist, but all these, all these things stuck. In the face of this onslaught, the Tsarina remained faithful to her spiritual guru, 
at great personal cost. The rumours rot whatever lingering affection there was for the emperor and empress. They were very beleaguered in those war years, increasingly isolated. There's increasing threat of revolution and turmoil and huge amounts of criticism being thrown at them. Rasputin offered them comfort at a time when very few other people could do that. Outside the bubble of the Imperial Palace, Russia was being torn apart. And by the summer of 1916, the Tsarina was particularly isolated. Nicholas had gone to the Eastern Front, where the war was going badly for Russia, and she was left alone. He's living in a dreary hotel, the Hotel Bristol, and going for long walks and looking at Hollywood eight-reeler films in the evening and writing all the time to his darling wife and totally in, in some sort of vacuum. With the Tsar so far away, Rasputin took a step closer to power in Petrograd, where the Tsarina was running the home front. The relationship with between Alexander and Rasputin accelerates quite intensively. And so during those war years, during that intense period of isolation, she clung ever more to him and more and more sought his advice on matters of state. I think it's incredibly important that, that Rasputin is not seen just as somebody who can keep the heir to the throne safe, but can be that backbone that Nicholas sorely lacks. Rasputin had a view on every aspect of the war effort. And through the Tsarina, he began to send messages to Nicholas at the front. I think at times he must have had to let it wash over him because it was just endless, you know, sometimes two or three letters a day, page after page after page of be strong, do this, do that, do the other. By the second half of 1916, it's becoming very clear that Russia is heading towards a crisis. Rasputin also exerted his influence in Petrograd, choosing cabinet posts for his friends and allies. There was this waltz of the cabinets, they were coming, they were going, there was complete instability at the heart of a nation at war. In 1916 alone, there were four prime ministers, four interior ministers, three foreign ministers and two war ministers. So he clearly is now sort of involving himself in the highest sort of uh, government affairs that you could imagine. But there was one appointment in particular that caused fury and shock. Rasputin decided that his friend, Protopopov, should be made Minister of the Interior, one of the most powerful offices in wartime. Nicholas was alarmed at the suggestion and tried to resist. Our friends' opinions of people are sometimes very queer. Therefore, one must be careful, especially with high offices. At Rasputin's urging, the Tsarina wrote again. Eight days later, Protopopov was appointed Minister of the Interior. Rasputin suddenly is able to appoint people to run his great country. And he does so with some relish and with disastrous consequences. Rasputin was at the pinnacle of power, running the country at the Tsarina's side. But this powerful bond between them was about to trigger the most shocking scandal of all, and one that threatened to destroy the monarchy. Faked photos and lurid jokes spread through Petrograd claiming the unthinkable. That the peasant Rasputin was having an affair with the Empress herself. There were grossly abusive cartoons in circulation, really nasty sexual cartoons of Alexander Rasputin. The most horrendous things were said. Clearly he 
enjoyed sex and had it whenever he could. Uh, but never, of course, with, with, with the Tsarina. I mean, that, that is fiction. He had enough sense not to foul his own nest. I mean, the idea that Queen Victoria's rather prim granddaughter, the Empress Alexandra, had anything to do with any of this is, of course, rubbish. <laughs> so those rumours had a cumulative effect that was just a constant assault on the integrity of, of the emperor and empress. If they believe in this debauched object, what sort of people are they? Why should we die for them? Incredibly, the Tsar did nothing. The rest of the Romanovs watched in horror as scandal and shame engulfed the royal household. They're inundated with all these rumours and, you know, complaints. And they also, I think, to some extent, in certain cases, feel personally humiliated that some slightly sort of, you know, shady peasant um, has wormed his way into the confidence of the Tsar and the Tsarina. And they're terrified that this will undermine the monarchy's prestige and bring about a revolution. Here is a country that's at war. It's lost five million dead, wounded and missing. It has rampant inflation. It has a great shortage of food. It has strikes going on. It is in a desperate way. And here is Rasputin, who is very visible, going out to restaurants night after night, getting drunk, uh, creating scenes, uh, a lecture scene with society women. I mean, this is like, you know, family dysfunction of an epic proportion. No one in the family could stomach the fact that Rasputin was still at court. Almost all of them spoke to Alexandra or to Nicholas about it at some point by final months of 1916, and each time they're rebuffed. Finally, in October 1916, the Romanovs sent a message to the Tsar with an ultimatum. Get rid of Rasputin, or the people will get rid of you. Grand Duke Nikolai Mikhailovich goes to speak to Nicholas uh, at the headquarters and, you know, has written a letter um, saying, you know, you need to get rid of Rasputin. You know he's damaging. You know that we are sort of on a precipice. Um, and the only thing that can potentially save the dynasty and save Russia is if you get rid of Rasputin and send him away. They're acting partly in self-defense, um, increasingly panic-stricken self-defense. But also, you've got to get rid of this man because uh, he represents a tremendous threat uh, to the survival of the regime. You stand on the eve of a new era of unrest, an era of assassination. This was the final warning from the family, and it could not have been clearer. But instead of dealing with it head on, Nicholas sent the letter to his wife. And this provoked a furious response from Alexandra, who said he was a traitor, he was loathsome, he was vile. So the one attempt by the family to, to sort it out failed utterly. I mean, utterly. And, you know, this only brings, I would say, Rasputin, Alexandra and Nicholas closer together. Rasputin was now public enemy number one, both at court and across the country. But he also had a deadly enemy further from home. London was taking a very keen interest in events in Petrograd, and in Rasputin in particular. Oswald Rayner, a British man living in Petrograd, had a top secret mission to do anything possible to prevent Russia from withdrawing from World War I. 
Oswald Rayner was actually the person responsible for um, intercepting telegrams and communications of all kinds. The British intelligence mission were literally eavesdropping and reading classified exchanges between a whole host of people in Petrograd by the hour. Rayner had useful connections in royal, aristocratic and political circles. There was one name he heard mentioned more than any other. It was like the breaking of the surf on a shore. All you ever heard was Rasputin, Rasputin, Rasputin. Rayner was especially interested in Rasputin because of a telegram he'd written to Tsar Nicholas on the outbreak of war two years earlier. And he wrote to Nicholas begging him not uh, to go to war and saying it would be the ruin of Russia. He foresaw night, he foresaw much blood, he foresaw the end of, of Russia as it was. Thou art the Tsar, father of the people. Don't allow the madmen to triumph and destroy themselves. He's against the war right from the start, but he's savvy enough to know that the influence that he's uh, built up over the last five, six years could, could go in a puff of smoke if the royal family goes. Rayner was worried that Rasputin was still arguing his case against the war to the Tsar. If Russia pulled out of the war, Britain would be exposed to the full might of the German army on the Western Front. If Nicholas had listened to Rasputin, you know, the history, not just of Russia, but the history of Europe and the world in the 20th century might have turned out very differently. Another rumor picked up by Rayner was even more alarming. That Rasputin wasn't just a pacifist, he was actually a German spy out to destroy Russia itself. Russians don't want to sort of look in the mirror and say, well, maybe we're to blame. No, no, no. If we're, not, if we're not winning this war, it can't be our fault. There must be some hidden hand at work. And they grasp at this idea of, of, of treason and bin it on Rasputin and on Alexandra. The fact that the Tsarina was Anglo-German only added to the people's fears. There's a long tradition of German, people of German origin at court, you know, and indeed the Empress herself is called a German. A mood of panic, hysteria, spy mania um, dominates uh, Petrograd. It's all absolute nonsense, uh, but it's very damaging. And the British and French did to some extent believe the rumours because much of the, the, the Petrograd high society world from which they got their information believed it. Rasputin was hounded by the press. British intelligence had him in their sights. The Romanov family wanted him gone, and the Russian public hated him. From 1915 onwards, Rasputin received a steady stream of anonymous death threats. No mercy will be shown to you. Our hands will not shrink. Wherever you go, death will follow you. Rasputin was now an open target. One man in particular had him in his sights. On November the 19th, a firebrand populist called Vladimir Purishkevich stood up in the Duma and named Rasputin as the cause of Russia's tragic death toll in the war. All evil proceeds from those dark forces, from influences headed by Gregory Rasputin. His style was deliberately confrontational. It was extreme Jew-hating, right-wing politician. Many of the Duma politicians, including Purushkevich, believe in uh, this myth of dark forces, so-called, swirling around Nicholas and Alexandra in the court. Burishkevich had an avid spectator at the Duma that day. He was called Prince Felix Yusupov.
The next day, Rasputin received an unexpected visitor. It was Prince Felix. Felix Yusupov was a flamboyant figure in Petrograd, a cross-dressing homosexual. He was a member of the Romanov family by marriage. He told Rasputin he needed healing. Felix Yusupov came from the richest family in Russia. He was the kind of spoilt, sybaritic, hedonistic aristocrat of the period, who even when he came to Britain to study at Oxford, brought his uh, Russian chef, his French chauffeur, and even his polo ponies with him. There's talk about how he's ill and that Rasputin is going to treat him, and he describes in his memoirs the strange moment where he lies down, you know, and Rasputin passes his hands over him. His face was so close to mine that I saw only his eyes. Then he began to make passes over me with his hands. Rasputin's hypnotic power was enormous. I think initially it's trying to win his trust because again you know Rus uh, Rasputin is a very savvy individual you know he, he, he his guard would have been you know would have been raised you know I think in in the, in the whole story of Rasputin uh, Prince Felix Yusupov is, is one of the most repugnant if not the most repugnant people that, that that you run across his motivation for really sort of trying to get close to Rasputin is the desire to kill him As Yusupov drew Rasputin closer, he was hatching a plot with two of Rasputin's key enemies. Purishkevich, the rabble-rousing speechmaker at the Duma, and a young aristocrat, Duke Dmitry Pavlovich, the blood nephew of Tsar Nicholas. The people who conspire to murder Rasputin, not revolutionaries, they are three total reactionaries. The objective was simple enough, to find a way to lure Rasputin to Yusupov's palace, where they could kill him. The plot would exploit Rasputin's greatest weakness, his love of beautiful women. Yusupov was married to the most beautiful woman in Petrograd. He told Rasputin she was a nymphomaniac and asked him to come and cure her. The date of the meeting and Rasputin's fate was set. Did Rasputin have any doubts about this meeting? Some months earlier, his secretary claimed that Rasputin had dictated a letter to the Tsar foreseeing his own death. If it was your relations who have wrought my death, then no one of your family, that is to say, none of your children or relations, will remain alive for more than two years. I shall be killed. I am no longer among the living. Rasputin knew there were people out there gunning for him, yes. He kind of had no illusions as to how much he was hated. Rasputin clearly foresaw his own demise, and uh, I think uh, he certainly expected to die at some point, yes, and die violently. You never know where the next bullet's coming from, and I'm sure Rasputin understood that. Yusupov set the scene for the murder with fanatical relish. He refurbished his palace and laid out a sumptuous feast of cakes and wine, all suffused with poison. The whole murder and the plot was like a line from his favorite author, Oscar Wilde. There was this sort of crazy romanticism. He was going to be the hero, he was going to be the assassin. And again, this is what makes him, I think, just such an odious figure. He goes on at such great length about how he set the stage and the individual items in the room as basically a way of saying, look at me, the aesthete, look at my fine taste, look at my sensibilities, and look at my great wealth. If I'm going to kill a man, I'm going to do it in a beautifully furnished room. 
Rasputin had less than 12 hours to live. The grisly tale of Rasputin's death has a remarkable source. It comes direct from the memoirs of the murderer himself, Prince Felix Yusupov. I rang the bell. Who's that? called a voice from inside. It is I, Rasputin. I've come for you. This is not an invitation from your next door neighbor. You know, you don't on the whole expect to be murdered by the Tsar's nephew-in-law. As Yusupov ushered Rasputin into the murder room, he apologized. Irina was delayed with other guests. Perhaps he would like to make himself comfortable. I hesitated before handing him the cake sprinkled with cyanide. The poison should have acted immediately, but to my amazement, Rasputin went on talking calmly. Time went by. The clock said 2.30. The nightmare had lasted two hours. Yusupov went to consult with his fellow plotters, who were hiding upstairs. I took Dmitri's revolver and went back to the basement. I aimed at his heart and pulled the trigger. Rasputin gave a wild scream and crumpled up. The men celebrated before disposing of Rasputin's body. As we talked, I was suddenly filled with a vague misgiving. The devil, who was dying of poison, who had a bullet in his heart, must have been raised from the dead by the powers of evil. Felix Yusupov's detailed account of the murder has made it one of the most infamous assassinations in history. But the story doesn't add up. The thing that's frustrating historically is how much of this is just pure invention. It's a story that's borrowed from, from the Middle Ages. You know, you poison him, you shoot him, but he's, he's, he jumps up and he's sprinting across the courtyard. <laughs> The autopsy report, in my view, very factually says there is no sign whatsoever of poison in this man's system. It's possible that, that no poison was really even administered. It's also possible that if it went in the cakes, they were not eaten, because we do know Rasputin didn't like sweets. That's not all. Autopsy photos later show that Rasputin was shot three times by two different guns. The 
fatal shot to the head, which Yusupov claims to have fired himself, came from another gun. Modern day forensic specialists can pretty much say which caliber bullets would have caused certain wounds. It, it's, it's highly probable that the wound was caused by a Webley unjacketed round. The unique thing about a Webley handgun is that uh, they were only issued to British personnel. So was Yusupov hiding an even darker secret? It was um, a plot that was steered and coordinated by British officers in the first place. We know that Rayner and Yusupov um, are friends from university. I think they've been members of the Bullingdon Club together at Oxford, so there is a very a strong link, a friendship between those two men. Within hours of the body dis being discovered, word on the street is that the British are responsible. This is a story that gains credibility very, very quickly, um, and the Tsar even quizzes the head of the British intelligence mission about these rumours. On the surface, the British had very, very good reasons to see Rasputin done away with, because, of course, he was preaching um, an end to the war. But it was Yusupov's version that very quickly became the official one, because he, Purishkevich and Pavlovich, confessed immediately. Yusupov was sent to the country, Pavlovich was posted to Persia, and Purishkevich walked free. It was a great act of patriotism to kill Rasputin. People went into the churches and lit candles and prayed and celebrated him on the streets for having got rid of this monstrous creature, Rasputin. The Tsarina alone was devastated. She placed a letter inside Rasputin's coffin. My dear martyr, give me thy blessing, that it may follow me always on the sad and dreary path I have yet to follow here below. But Rasputin had left behind a curse, not a blessing. If it was your relations who have wrought my death, then no one of your family will remain alive for more than two years. Rasputin's murder was grotesque and savage and botched. In many ways, as grotesque and botched and savage as the ultimate murder of the Romanovs themselves. Two months after Rasputin's death, the Tsar was toppled from power. And on the 17th of July, 1918, the whole family was executed. In 1649, the King of England, Charles I, was put on trial for treason, found guilty and beheaded. But could Charles have avoided his brutal death? And why is his fate entwined with the will of an ordinary soldier named Oliver Cromwell? It's movie night over on our brand new channel, Spike with The Expendables 2 next. Here on Channel 5, things are far from harmonious for Alex Polizzi as she tackles a musical-themed B&B in Torquay in the new Hotel Inspector.